What's going on everybody? This is John Jink Gaming on the mic here coming at you with a brand new episode of the FCS Dynasty here on NCAA Football 2006 as well as the NCAA Next Mod being featured as well as we got eight games on tap here once again with some incredible FCS action each game featuring at least one top 25 matchup so gonna want to strap in you're gonna want to buckle up because we got a great episode on our hands make sure you go ahead smack that like button hit that subscribe button as well if you do happen to be brand new and we'll start things out here with a punt but not only a punt but a punt going to the brown bears that will help them seize the lead here early against the number 15 team in the country the tennessee tech golden eagles who actually both these teams just got a lo logo makeover, at least for their uh, their uh, their main brand. But those new uniforms could be gonna, gonna be coming in with version 10. I'm really excited about version 10 coming out. This is version 9 as of the recording of this video. But we got a pretty tight game here in this first one between the Brown Bears and the Tennessee Tech Golden Eagles. Both teams who did make it to the FCS playoffs last year. As Chase Jones, he's gonna be lit up like a christmas tree there trying to pick up the first down they tried to do a quarterback draw but just way too much yardage needed in order to pick up the first down so no surprises here they're gonna punt for it on fourth and 16 and not only gonna see one touchdown oh no we're gonna see two cute punt returns for a touchdown and before the brown offense can evens take the field they take a two possession lead here early and it puts this freshman quarterback chase jones in a pretty compromising spot as his court his teammates around him just really aren't standing up for the challenge they kind of sweep walked into this game assuming they can beat brown but guys this team went to the fcs playoffs last year they are like that and they are funding that out the hard way here as this 17 to nothing lead here Gets built up early as the tailback, Tony Pat, uh, Glenn, going to go ahead and run this thing into the end zone. It's another touchdown for the Brown Bears. And a 24-3 lead here with a chance to get some more points on the board before we go into halftime. Marcus Patrick going to get it off to his wide receiver. And his receiver does the rest of the work there as it ends up being... A 40-yard touchdown pass makes it 31-3 to here. And the Brown Bears with just a commanding lead against the number 15 team in college football right now. And Chase Jones and company in serious trouble as he's going to also throw his very first career interception against this Brown defense. So it goes from being bad to worse. As Marcus Patrick and company, he's got one more chance to add points on the board and finds his receiver deep downfield. Marcus Patrick just continues to impress me with how good he's been handling this type of pressure, you know, in his freshman campaign, you know, going up against James Madison, who was ranked in the top 10, as well as this Tennessee Tech squad that's ranked in the top 20. It's not easy to go on the road against either of these teams, but... He's been handling himself really well overall, and that is a big reason why they have this lead right now. 38-3 to at the halftime right now. I am not making this up. I did not think it was going to be this much of a blowout, but we still got a half of football left to play here. We'll see if Chase Jones can fare better here in the second half as he rolls out to the right, does find his receiver, and Chase Jones will also be going ahead and throwing his very first career touchdown of his college career as a true freshman. So a 38 to 10 ball game here as Brown trying to keep him at a distance. But once again, not only turning the football over, but if we're going to have ourselves a little bit of a scoop and score there as Tony Patrick or Tony Parker, he's going to let this football on the ground. So we might have a little bit more interesting of a ball game. 38-17. We'll see if Marcus Patrick and company can get his guys back on track. And sure enough, 
How about throwing this ball into triple coverage? Can we talk about that for a sec? Because that is not an easy throw to make by any stretch of the imagination. And he certainly just did that as Patrick will look to throw again. This time going towards his tight end and his tight end is going to go ahead and find the end zone. Touchdown Brown and a 40 burger for the Bears makes it 45 to 17. And it's only going to get worse as Jace Jones is going to throw his second interception of the afternoon there. So, wow, absolutely crazy stuff here. And just the first game alone did not see this coming. Told you, man, the upset alarms are, are ringing. I'm sure they are just on maximum volume now. And it gives Brown a chance to get their backups in. This is actually Chase McCoy the custom recruit that is playing for brown university actually josh mccoy he is uh, this is his collegiate debut here um did not looking too great did end up getting sacked there on his very first play but keep in mind he is playing with the backups while tennessee tech they're not going to give up just yet these are they still have their starters out on the field and Vince Fonanot, he's going to take advantage of that as Fonanot, he's going to get loose down the sideline. Touchdown, Tennessee Tech and the Eagles get another one on the board. Make that 45 to 31. It does make this game just a little bit more on the competitive side. Makes it look a little bit better in the box score, but this game was never in doubt after the first half. Brown going to pull the upset off here against the 15th ranked team in college football Tennessee Tech and Brown will also go ahead and secure their first win of the season big time win as this team has been tested in the early part of the season in non-conference you know between James Madison between this Tennessee Tech squad as well they challenged themselves in non-conference play and I think that's going to provide some dividends when they go into Ivy League action would not be shocked if we ended up seeing this Brown squad make it into the FCS playoffs as an automatic qualifier. But we have some other intense matchups throughout the country as South Carolina State is going to go on the road to take on the North Carolina A&T State Aggies in the Carolina Classic. And there is certainly no secret here whatsoever. Both of these teams absolutely hate each other with an absolute passion. It is no secret whatsoever. And South Carolina State, they are enjoying their, I believe this is their very first top 25 ranking in this FCS series here in year number two. Coming in at number 25 in the country. But you never know with these rivalry games, man. Rivalries that have that extra passion. And sometimes you get some wonky results, man. You know, Michigan, Michigan State. You know, anyone that's know about rivalry games, you know what I'm talking about. But early on here, South Carolina State looks like they're ready for that early challenge going into a particularly hostile environment, going into your rival team stadium, as that is going to end up being picked off and turning into a pick six. And also South Carolina State Bulldogs build a 10-0 lead here. But hang on now. We might have the biggest play of the entire season so far. One man left the beat and just runs out of real estate. Devontae Carter with a 98-yard rushing touchdown. And that was exactly what North Carolina a and needed in order to get themselves right back into this game. And not only that, they also secure an interception as well. A perfect opportunity to at the very least tie things up here or even take the lead depending on what they do in these next few plays they do end up settling for a field goal on a free and out but this game is still end up being tied and like i said rivalry games man you never know what can happen especially when the added passion is inserted into these football games man as south carolina state is going to get an interception so they're set up at about the 34 yard line as mcdoodle does have a little bit of time, but that internal clock was not synced up as he gets hit from the blind side. And North Carolina A&T is going to recover the fumble, keeping the Bulldogs at bay, but cannot capitalize off the turnover. So it still remains all knotted up at 10 apiece. 
as that could very well get them into field goal range. This was not an easy throw to make. One on one ends up turning into one on two. Had to be a perfect throw, and it was that. So it sets the Bulldogs up into field goal range. Only the sixth career field goal for Matt Mitchell, who hits this 45 yard field goal attempt and naturally just gets it right through the uprights. So South Carolina State will take a 13 to 10 lead here as we are getting into the last couple of minutes of this ball game could still go either way the Aggies with a chance to win it with 17 seconds left as we're going to see a drop back going to try to throw it up but it's going to be intercepted in South Carolina State they are going to just barely and I mean barely by the skin of their teeth they are going to avoid the upset bid here in the Carolina Classic as the Bulldogs are going to improve to 3-0 here on this young season. Well, North Carolina a &T, they are still desperately searching for their very first win of the season. They will fall to 0-3 after this unfortunate loss here in this another edition of the Carolina Classic. And this was an ugly game. Neither team with more than 200 yards of total offense. Not a lot of ball movement, and we saw more turnovers than touchdowns, but South Carolina State will pull it off. So speaking of trying to pull some things off, we'll see if Georgia Southern can finally go ahead and get their first win of year number two, as they've had a pretty slow start so far, an unexpectedly slow start. They were favored in both of their previous two games, but they lost both, first losing to Towson and now UCF. So now they get into conference play to try to go ahead and get things right as they now will be going on the road here to take on the Citadel Bulldogs. And listen, Citadel has learned to find a way to keep things at least competitive for most of the game. They've shown some improvement uh, since that season one blowout loss to William and Mary as Ikeda Woods is going to pitch it out to his tailback, Albert Minacci. And Albert Minacci is going to go off here early as he's going to finally get the uh, the goose egg off the scoreboard for really both teams. As we were here in the second quarter, this was the first score right here. So, very pretty uh, defensive battle here early. This is kind of what we expected as both teams do like to run the football and also grind some time off the clock. But neither team, you know, finishing their drives at least... Not yet here, but we still, you know, have a lot of football left to play, obviously. As now we do have a second and seven here. Ikeda Woods going to go ahead, and he's going to actually keep it here. He's going to end up being tripped up inside the 10-yard line, but a nice job by Ikeda Woods. Keeping it on the option, if it wasn't for that dive, that super dive cheese, probably could be talking about a rushing touchdown for Ikeda Woods, but instead it's Albert Minacci who is going to receive the pitch from Ikeda Woods. And it's going to be the second touchdown of the day for him. As Ikeda Woods, if you check out the replay, he could have got it into the end zone all by himself. But you know what it is, man. He's just trying to be a distributor. That's what it is as a quarterback at the end of the day. But he does try to pass the football there. And it doesn't necessarily work out for him. He's going to throw an interception here. And it gives the Citadel an opportunity to really get right back into this game. And, I mean, Ikeda Woods, he, he had all the time in the world. He had protection. Uh, it's not like he was forced to make a play. He just made a bad decision. And, you know, sometimes that happens when you have an option quarterback who is not used to passing the football, which Georgia Southern, they have not done that as much here in year two as they did in year number one. Don't know if it's a style and philosophy or what's really going on here. But look at this. Joe Washington fumbles the football and the fullback is going to actually get the fumble recovery here. As look at this. There was a bunch of Georgia Southern guys around, but none of them can fall on it. Now they do go for the two point conversion. It does end up being no good. So it ends up being a five point game in Albert Minacci wants to make sure 
that this team does not get upset three weeks in a row. They're trying to stick around in this top 25. They believe they are an actual top 25 squad. And so far, they're playing more up to that standard as that extends their lead up to a 21-9 affair. As now, Ikeda is going to hand it off to Minachi again. Breaks a few tackles and fires his way through to the end zone. Touchdown, Eagles. And uh, Minachi having a career day here so far. That is rushing touchdown number four. For the junior tailback, just an absolutely incredible performance so far. And it puts the Citadel in deep trouble. As y'all already know, for watching the Citadel earlier this year, particularly against Montana back in week number two, um, if they have to put to work with the football or pass the football, uh, it's usually not a good res response for them, right? They're usually they're more used to running the football. That's what they're more comfortable with. And speaking of being more comfortable, Minachi just really in his bag today he's gonna get this punt return for a touchdown even dance his way down the sideline as well as he ends up with over 250 yards of total offense here today and that also is good for five touchdowns which is all of the points that georgia southern not only scored but that was all that they needed as well as they finally do get their first win of the season they take down the citadel the Citadel going to go ahead and fall to one and two. I would like to see Ikea Woods pass the football a little bit more. Didn't really see too many passing attempts really from either team in this one. As yeah, Ikea Woods ends up throwing the ball only three times today for, for a total of 15 yards. Uh, really a Mac Jones and Buffalo kind of situation right here. But Georgia Southern wins, so they should remain in the top 25. Speaking of that top 25, though, we got our first top 25 matchup here in this episode as the games just keep heating up. We now go into an early Conference USA matchup between the number 14 ranked SMU Mustangs taking on the green wave of Tulane. As Tulane, you know, after being featured on the year one preseason magazine, they were bounced in the first round of the FCS playoffs last year, SMU making it to the second round and smu they are certainly feeling themselves right now as they just come off of a huge victory against north texas in the game of the week so here they are trying to make sure that they don't have that same kind of wet down again but early on jack irvin of tulane is gonna hand it off to his fullback and tulane here at home is gonna strike first here and y'all already know not the expert for those of you that enjoyed his content you know he's smiling out there somewhere as we got ourselves a fullback you touchdown but how about this one-on-one -on -one matchup on the outside that might have been tipped and it still ends up being a touchdown yeah that really was tipped so it is better to be lucky than it is to be good either way to lane with a 14 nothing lead we'll see if smu can break the mold here but it goes the opposite way a fumble in the green wave are going to recover just an absolute barrage of waves attacking this mustangs defense is now jack irvin off the turnover he's gonna get some time in the pocket and once again another touchdown caught off the tip the tip drill is real in this ball game right now as that's the second time that a tipped ball has led to a touchdown that favors Tulane and the green wave going to be up early in this one and they are up big 24 to nothing as again to the late stages of the third quarter once again we got our main man Jack Irvin with all the time in the world I could have made myself a sandwich if I wanted to but Jack Irvin is going to turn that sandwich into a touchdown instead. So a 31 to nothing game here as a Tulane Green Wave. They are going to end up winning by a final score of 45 to nothing. So let's check in on now on one of the teams that was considered at least in that year two preseason uh, episode to be a sleeper. And that is the Western Carolina Catamounts who come in ranked number 22 in the nation, playing host to the Bulldogs of Yale University. 
And this could be an interesting matchup because Brandon McKee is actually injured. So their backup quarterback, Tommy Bell, is coming in. Had a pretty good start, 20 for 26, 233 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. But the lights are brighter in this one. We'll see if he can handle it as we'll go ahead now and jump right into the second half. Still a close game after two quarters, but maybe we'll see someone finally break this game wide open. As this man is wide but naked open going down the sideline and he is gone. Touchdown, Catamounts as Mama, there goes that man. And despite the Catamounts having only 62 yards of total offense in the first half, they got a two-score lead, man. You love to see it as Bell looks to the right-hand side, and he throws his first career interception of his life at the college level. And now Yale has a chance to get right back into this ball game right now. You absolutely hate to see it as he had two receivers in the vicinity, threw right in between the middle, made it easy for the Yale guy to choose. But Yale could not also take advantage. So it still is a 10-point lead in favor of the Catamounts. They're going to try to build off of it as Bell under center. He's going to fake the handoff. He's going to throw it across his body. He's finding the fullback. And this fullback can scoot it and nearly finds himself into the end zone. They are going to mark him down right at the one-yard line. As that will set up a beautiful opportunity for the Catamounts to get another touchdown on the board their first offensive touchdown of the game potentially if they can finish this drive off as they'll go with a bunch of offensive linemen but hang on one of those offensive linemen was eligible and one of the big linemen ends up getting a touchdown you love seeing those big hog molly guys getting involved in the offense you gotta reward them as they are putting in all that work on the line of scrimmage and it's a 20 to 3 lead for the catamounts as yale trying to get back into this game tailback able to get out into the open one man left to beat he can't shake off that final defender but lonnie snyder able he was boxed in there but somehow houdini his way out of there if he matter of fact if he had one more block that would have been a touchdown, no questions asked. But instead, the drive continues for the Yale Bulldogs as Frederick Davis has been off to a hot start so far this season. Get him out, so I've only played one other game to this point, but that is already Douglas's third sack of the season. Definitely a hot start for him uh, on pace for 15 to 20 sacks, which would be insane if he can keep that up for an entire season. As we see, Mama, there goes that man as Williams is going to take this thing to the crib and is going to take it for a 73-yard touchdown. So we saw some issues in the first half. That's why I really didn't show any uh, highlights in the first half because, let's be honest, uh, y'all would have been a little bit more bored uh, um, just uh, seeing field goals back and forth, right? Like, ain't nobody trying to see that. Unless it's a game-winning field goal, then... You know, that, that's a different story, right? But that being said, uh, got a game-ending interception. Western Carolina, they did struggle and maybe sleepwalked a little bit in the first half. But, you know, they, they made some adjustments in the second half. They were able to pull away, use the talent on their depth chart. Remember, they also signed the number two class in America. You know, so they brought in some high-quality recruits, you know, for this upcoming season. And the results are showing on the field as Western Carolina top 25 team showing that they handle business like a top 25 team as well they go to 2-0 as this will now take us into the game of the week featuring the bobcats of ohio university and the number one team in the land so far in season number two the eastern carolina pirates eastern carolina a team that was bounced early dropped in the round of 16 last year after they were upset by Eastern Michigan, but they are, of course, out for blood. Still considered highly regarded as they have been the number one team in college football ever since St. Thomas beat UCLA, UNLV back in week number two. 
So we'll see if Eastern Carolina can hang on to that title as they do also feature the front runner for the Heisman, Barrett Haston. But no Barrett Haston highlights, at least not yet, because it's the Ricky McFadden show early as he is going to be able to slide in the pocket with efficiency. And on the first drive of the game for the Pirates, a 79-yard touchdown. Great throw, too, on the run to go with it, and none of the Ohio players can catch up. So a 7-0 game here thus far, as we'll see Barrett Haston trying to get some work in, but Haston is actually going to fumble the football right there. And the Ohio Bobcats are going to recover. They, they're the number 12 team in America. They are no slouches either. A matter of fact, fourth and goal on the two. They are going to go ahead and risk it for the biscuit. Is now fourth and goal on the two-yard line. Get it to the tailback. Who forces his way into the end zone. Touchdown, Ohio. And it's now all knotted up at seven apiece. We got ourselves a battle on our hands as well as Ohio. They got a legitimate shot of winning this thing as they are they have hold things down against Barrett Haston. He was the Heisman front runner, at least what we saw in the end of the week three episode. We'll have to see how things stand after uh, like all the games have been completed for you know this week here in week number four. But Barrett Haston has been contained. He's been contained pretty well, actually. Good job by the Ohio defense, but offense just isn't really helping at all. So they get another uh, opportunity to get some points on board. But thankfully for them, Rick and McFadden, they got some things working and they got some things going as we got ourselves a 42-yard touchdown pass as Rick and McFadden able to roll out to his right. That is touchdown number five on the year. So going into the final quarter of play, a 14-7 lead, trying to get it out to Barrett Haston. But Justin Perry is able to cut it off. And that's going to be the third interception of his college career. As Riggy McFadden also throwing his first pick of the season. Ohio still with a chance to win this game with two minutes left to play. Danny Graves trying to throw it out to the perimeter. And that could very well be the dagger as Ricky Bentley, the outside linebacker, gets his paws on the football as that pressure was just simply too much to handle. And now a two-score lead. So now Ohio must score on this drive. And not only that, they're going to have to convert the onside kick. They do get at least one of those two things to happen. They get the quick touchdown. Got about a minute left, so it's not over. But they got to get this onside kick. Can they recover? Kicker. Going to go ahead and get the onside. And it ends up being recovered by the Eastern Carolina Pirates. And that is going to be barbecue chicken here as ECU should remain as the number one team in FCS college football. They win a close one. The final score being 21-14. to They even give him a Gatorade bath. You wouldn't see that at the FBS level if, you know, Alabama wins a top 25 matchup. Uh, you know, just, just a difference in, uh, I guess, mentality, I guess, uh, between FBS and FCS college football. But that's just me. I know Eastern Carolina usually isn't in this type of position to be, you know, considered nationally ranked and being highly regarded in a national championship discussion. But Eastern Carolina, they improved to 3-0 while the Bobcats will go ahead and take their first loss of the season, but they shouldn't be penalized too much in the polls. As we got yet another top 25 matchup and one of the two matchups that I've been looking forward the most, and that's why I have it towards the end for you guys. We got Southeast Missouri State's number 23 in the country. They go across the country out in Montana, taking on the number five ranked Montana Grizzlies. And Montana, you know, we knew that they are on a mission right now. Making it to the semifinals last year, whereas Southeast Missouri State, they did not make it into the playoffs in year number one. So they're going to be looking to send a message here possibly, but they got to find a way to contain Derek Keith. As Keith is going to start this game off with a play action. Got some time to work with, but eventually the clock runs out and we got an early interception here by the Red Hawks defense. 
And we know Coach Ty Bergian of Southeast Missouri State. He is loving that early. His team playing well early on as Grant Williams. He is going to fire a missile out over the sideline. And Gwen Williams will see his receiver pick up a huge first down. Kind of a dream start here for the number 23 team in the nation. As Williams continues to drive this time. Fires it up towards the end zone. And it ends up being caught. Touchdown, Southeast Missouri State. A 48-yard touchdown strike. That'll allow the, the Red Hawks to strike first on the road. It's a 7-0 lead here early. As now, Derek Keefe looking to provide a response. He's going to try to launch one downfield as well. But that's going to be intercepted. Josh Bell, the safety, the last line of defense, comes through in the clutch as Derek Keefe. He's not going to be experiencing any points on this drive. No, sir. Although the Red Hawks cannot fully take advantage as they will only get a field goal. But still, strong start here early. Up 10 to nothing. Can't complain there. As now we'll see uh, Montana punt this football away. And we might have ourselves a little bit of special teams action as we are not going to see any flags on the field. And it will be a 78-yard touchdown. Southeast Missouri State, 17 to nothing right now. You could hear a squirrel fart in this stadium. As they, it's just been an absolutely shocking affair. As sometimes it's looking to be good, man. Gwen Williams, he's balling out. And that man was going to be gone like a girl in a country song. Ends up being an 85-yard touchdown pass. It is the longest touchdown pass of season number two as Gwen Williams he was facing some pressure too he had a receiver open uh couldn't get all of it in there but give credit to his wide receiver did a very beautiful job of making some adjustments this is now a 24 to nothing lead here as hang on now it might even grow any bigger 31 to nothing Derek Keefe throws another interception that's his third interception thrown of the game. Just nasty stuff here. Montana not ready to play at all in this one. As they are currently getting embarrassed in their home stadium right now. As Williams looks to build off of it. He's going to throw another one down the sideline. And that is going to be cut. And that is going to be good for a touchdown. 38 to nothing. They are blowing out the number five team in America right now. That's absolutely insane to me. And Gwen Williams, he's on demon time right now, man. What, what else is there to say? As Derek Keefe and company will have a chance to possibly get something going before the end of the half. But another interception. Mark Smith, that's his second interception of the game. He's playing wide receiver. But because of the lack of depth at corner... He's stepping up and playing that wide receiver position as well, or that corner position, and he's doing a good job with it, using those soft, natural hands. What are we getting a touchdown the other way as well? It makes it 45 to nothing. There will be no more points scored in this game, but I think Southeast Missouri State, I think they sent a message here today, winning big on the road. Watch out for these guys. So we have definitely seen some... Honestly, really shocking uh, game results so far here. But what about in simulation? What's going on throughout the rest of this FCS universe? We'll go ahead and take a quick look around, starting with the number six Utah State Aggies almost getting pushed to the brink by the Montana State Bobcats. Utah State did end up winning in overtime, winning 36 to 30. But it was certainly a close call as Montana State loses their second game. As for San Diego State, though, they continue to roll pretty well. After a win against FBS Washington, they went on the road to take on Youngstown State and win convincingly there as well, winning 37-13. As for Ball State, they also experience a road game against Western Kentucky as the Hilltoppers fell short, falling to 0-2 after a 27-12 loss against number 11 ranked. Ball State Cardinals. UL Monroe looking to get themselves into the top 25 as they get a big time win against Appalachian State 
winning 52 to 7 on the road they now have a three game winning streak to start year number two as for north dakota state they are looking to try to get themselves back on track after a week one loss to the mid tennessee state blue raiders and North Dakota State does exactly that, making sure that Jackson State still looks for their first win of year number two as the Bison win 51-20, trying to prove that what happened earlier in the season was a complete fluke. UNLV, meanwhile, tried to get Indiana State to go back to earth a little bit, and they were successful in that regard. After UNLV almost lost their second game in a row to Alcorn State, they looked a lot better in their home matchup against the Sycamores, Winning 42-14, Indiana State losing their first game of the season. As for the Mid-Tennessee State Blue Raiders, they continue what has been an excellent year number two so far. Winning 35-25 against William and Mary. The Tribe losing their first game, and it looks like they will be denied an opportunity to get into the top 25. As for the Rice Owls, they come in ranked number 13 in the country. And will look to sneak their way into the top 10 as they took on the Southern Jaguars, winning 27 to 21. Southern, who came in with some hype coming into this year, signing the number one player in high school football. Not a good start for them. They are now 0 and 3. What has been a disappointing year for the Jaguars so far. As for Eastern Michigan, they tried to avoid falling out of the top 25 after a shocking loss to Sanford. But the Eagles went out against the Raging Cajuns, winning 31-26 to avoid that fate. Also looking to continue their hot streak after winning on the road against Georgia Southern. They go into conference play and took on the Northeastern Huskies out of Boston. And they win convincingly in their battle, winning 41-10. But Huskies now 1-2 after this blowout loss. So the final game of this episode features two teams that are both in the top 10 in what honestly should have been the game of the week. In my opinion, we got James Madison taking on the Wildcats of New Hampshire as they are meeting early on in this season. And what happened last year was that James, these two teams met in towards the end of last year and then decided who ended up going to that conference championship game. So, and I, that's what I expect to hear again this season. Whoever wins this game between these two teams, they will at the very least be in that driver's seat to go to the conference championship at the end of this season and compete for that uh, automatic qualifier into the FCS playoffs. So that being said, we'll jump right into it as Carlos Montoya is going to throw an early interception here. He struggled in the game last week against the University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, a bottom 10 team. James Madison clearly not that. They're the number four team in America as Raymer is going to look to the right-hand side all the time in the world and he throws a strike over to the four-star custom recruit, Travion Henderson, who's going to get into the end zone. It's a touchdown for the Dukes. It's going to make it a 7 to nothing game here early as James Madison gets the football once again on a 3rd and 10. Raymer is going to fire this one out to the right-hand side. He was looking for Brandon Thorne, but he overthrows him. And Tyler Boyd is going to get the interception, and it prevents James Madison from getting any points on the board there. So a 7 nothing lead early. As New Hampshire looks to get their first points on the board as Carlos Montoya all by himself in a five wide set. But that's going to be intercepted as well as Montoya already throwing his second interception. Granted, he does make the tackle, but an incredibly slow start here as he still has not even completed a pass yet. He starts off 0 for 6 and has those two interceptions to his name already and it sets up what could have been an easy touchdown for James Madison, but Kenny Raymer not only is going to throw an interception, but the interception is also going to end up being a pick six as well as Jalen Rankin is going to return this thing back 99 yards. And that will tie this ball game up at seven apiece here as James Madison now all knotted up with the New Hampshire Wildcats. 
And we'll see if Kenny Raymer can do a little bit better on this next drive. Play action. He's going to send this one downfield. He's got a receiver. And Brandon Forn is the one that is going to come down with it. Leaping grab. And now a chance to take the lead. But got to convert this fourth down. And he does. Touchdown. Dukes of James Madison. As the tight end catches it off of the tip. The tip drill in full effect right now. And James Madison will re-seize the lead. Making it 14-7. Sometimes it really is better to be lucky than it is to be good. As Montoya, he's going to launch one downfield. And that's going to be caught for a substantial game as well. Mama, there goes that man. As that is going to be a huge touchdown. Looks like about 80 yards, I want to say. Just throwing an absolute missile down the sideline. And we got ourselves a high-scoring affair here. Hope you got the cleats out because, oh boy, we got ourselves a track beat right now as both offenses, if they're not uh, turning over the football, they are certainly firing on all cylinders as Dante Dowdell, he's going to rip a huge run off. That gets the Wildcats into the red zone as they will go to Dowdell once again, who bounces it to the outside and finds the end zone. Touchdown, Wildcats. And Wildcats make it 21 to 14 right there as Dowdell able to get to the outside without any resistance. They will take the seven point lead. But Raymer, not wasting much time, he's going to find the five-star custom, Jody Gentry, who's going to run this thing into the end zone himself. Just using that elite speed, one of the fastest players in college football. I believe he has like a 98 speed. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he was insanely quick, though. That's what I do remember. And we saw that on full display as no one could have caught up to him, not even the DBs who are... Typically, the fastest players on the team, your defensive backs, usually your best athletes that you have on your football team. But it's still all knotted up as Carlos Montoya facing pressure. He's got to roll to the right a little bit. Fires one downfield, and it's caught despite the double coverage. James Madison, they done a pretty solid job of getting pressure on Montoya. It is, you know... They got five hurries already here in this first half, but they have been able to finish. They have not been able to go ahead and uh, get, the, get the sacks that they're looking for. And so Montoya with a chance to take the lead and will get just that. As that is going to be yet another touchdown for the Wildcats, making it 28-21. And James Madison can't respond. So, New Hampshire... They got the football once again. Montoya going to fire a rocket down the sideline. And it ends up being caught inside the 30-yard line. Nice little wheel route there to get himself open. As now has 200 yards of passing offense. The second and 10 from the 12-yard line. Basically a goal line situation, but extra steps. Montoya looks downfield. Looks to the left and side. And it ends up being caught. Touchdown. New Hampshire. And we got 35 first half points for the Wildcats as their offense seems like they took a little bit of a break against UMKC, but they are back and they are firing on all cylinders now as James Madison, despite having that number one recruiting class, they're being tested. And man, the experience that Carlos Montoya has after, you know, he made some adjustments, he's tearing them up now. It sets up a goal line situation. Third and goal. Play action. End zone. Yet another touchdown for Montoya. As that makes it touchdown number four for the junior quarterback. As he had all the time in the world. Pressure couldn't even get close to getting to him. As after, you know, what was 21 all game is, is now turning into the Montoya show down here tonight. Is that, is that the fifth touchdown pass for Montoya? It does make it 49-21, to 21, making it 28 unanswered points. So now, less than a minute left here in the third quarter. Just trying to get anything going, trying to get it out to Brandon Forn. But he 
did not see the corner that was right in front of him. So Kenny Raymer throws yet another costly interception. And last year, James Madison, they took care of business against New Hampshire to go to the conference championship game. Unless we see a miracle right now because New Hampshire, they are 4 for 4 on red zone opportunities. Looks like the Wildcats are going to get that 50 burger, which we do end up seeing. So New Hampshire, they now get 50 plus points on the board. Makes it 56 to 21 in the later stages of this third quarter. And the Wildcats are going to win big in this one. Putting them in the driver's seat of the Coastal Divisional race. We'll see if this game has a major impact just like last year. So we get through week number four of this FCS dynasty as we see Utah State on the cover despite nearly seeing a massive upset from Montana State, which begs the question, what does the top 25 now currently look like? Checking on and see how things are shaping up. New Hampshire, they do move up to number four in the country after an extremely impressive victory over the Dukes of James Madison. That 59-21 win does put them in control of their destiny in that ACC Coastal Division. Meanwhile, North Dakota State, after their big win against Jackson State, they now move up to number 7 in the country with a 51-20 victory over the Tigers of Jackson State. Looking to rebound off of the difficult year that they've had, uh, or at least the difficult opening week that they had. Uh, James Madison... First loss of the year, they fall down to number 10 after a really tough loss of convincing loss. And so does Montana. They fall out of the top 10 entirely. Now down to number 12 in the country after a 45 to nothing loss. A very disappointing loss for that program. As we look through the rest of the top 25 now, Southeast Missouri State, their 45 nothing lead only moves them up four spots. Only number 19 in the country, so maybe not getting a lot of respect early, but they have also only played two games so far. Hopefully, they can get some respect on their name. Speaking of respect on their name, the Catamounts of Western Carolina are looking to do the same thing. A 27-3 win gets them up one spot to number 21. South Carolina State, a close win over their rival North Carolina A&T. They move up three spots despite only winning by a field goal. Citadel uh, lost by over 20 points to Georgia Southern. And the Eagles move up one spot because of that. And we do get one new team in the Idaho Vandals. Idaho now number 24 in the country. Which means Tennessee Tech did fall out after their upset loss to the Brown Bears at home as well. Granted, they are still sitting in uh, the others receiving votes along with Northern Arizona, Idaho State, San and Sanford in terms of being really close to getting into that top 25. But checking in on the players of the week though, and Albert Miniachi, the junior redshirt for Georgia Southern, he had a career day as y'all saw in the gameplay. He ends up with five total touchdowns against the Citadel, leading his team to a 39 to nothing victory where he ends up with all five total touchdowns. He also had 148 rushing yards on the ground. But for the Defensive Player of the Week, someone that actually did not play in gameplay, we got Daniel Martin, the senior linebacker for Eastern Illinois. His team hosting the Penn Quakers and beating Penn 24-18. Ends up with 13 total tackles, three TFLs, a sack, plus three forced fumbles in which he recovered two of them. No question that he was the difference in terms of why his team won in that matchup against Penn. And finally, we have the Heisman watch here as we got we got quite a few new faces. Uh, everyone's different besides Barrett Haston. Barrett Haston still on top. He did end up with over 100 total yards and three touchdowns against Ohio. So he is the front runner, but a bunch of new faces here. As we got Jeremy Patton, the senior redshirt out of Idaho, on the on the uh, the Heisman watch now, sitting in second. Then we see also Bobby Young, the senior from New Hampshire. He's in there as well. Five total touchdown grabs so far. 13 receptions, 304 yards. Part of a top five New Hampshire squad. 
in fourth place now a true freshman Lawrence Green out of Northern Arizona great debut season so far 22 catches 415 yards and six touchdowns that's getting some attention and then rounding out the group is a senior an old dog among these young pups Zach Gilmore he is has six rushing touchdowns one receiving touchdown so far and is a big reason why UCF has been really successful so far this year so that is the current Heisman front runner list so now with week on number four officially done and taken care of we will move into next episode which will mark about a third of the way through this regular season we'll of course have eight more games to show to you guys once again and then not only that but we will also have a conference standing update the first conference standings update uh, of season number two so i hope you guys are excited for it but in the meantime though if you enjoyed today's content do me a favor and smack that like button hit that subscribe button if you do happen to be brand new this is john jake gaming on the mic signing off i'm hoping you're all out there having a good one take care everybody